Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jade Grisham. I am an urban agriculture educator with Brooke, who couldn't be here tonight because she's teaching another class. So I'm kind of filling in. Um, I don't know a whole lot about native plants, so I'm here to learn as you guys are as well. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, feel free to message me directly. And um, if Ellen, if you want to introduce yourself, I know you're probably trying to get everything set up at the same time. Let me get this here so I can see more people. Oh, I recognize some names. Jane Savage, good to have you on. Ruth Ann, this is terrific. All right. I think I am ready to go. So anytime you're ready, Jade, um, just give me my sign and I'll get started. Uh, you can go ahead and introduce yourself, Ellen. I know it seems to be working okay now. Great, okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little bit of a cold, so um, excuse the, the coughing occasionally. Uh, I am going to be talking tonight on um, pesticide use in garden settings. Um, I think I saw the name of the Zoom session was something about herbicide. That's not really what we're talking about. I'm talking about pesticides in general, and then I'll get specific. I'll explain that as we go, give you the definitions. Um, if you have questions, if you want to put them in the chat, that would be great. And Jade, if you can just keep an eye on that and let me know if there are questions, because I can't see the chat box at the same time as I see my screen. Um, so pesticide use in garden settings. This is a talk I gave a few months ago to, um, I think it was the Fall Creek Garden Club. And um, I've gotten a few other requests to give it as well. Uh, and so hopefully you find useful information in this. Okay, my first caveat is that I'm not an expert on all pesticides. I am a licensed pesticide applicator, but my area of expertise is herbicides. So if you wanna go deeper on that topic, I can speak more knowledgeably than rodenticides or fungicides or any of the other types of pesticides. Um, I'm going to give you definitions so that we're all talking about the same thing. I'm going to give you some very basic overall guidance uh, and then uh, talk about types of pesticides in a little bit more specific, both herbicides and insecticides, and about a particular class of insecticides known as neonicotinoids. Okay. Anytime you talk about pesticides, you have to start with what is a pest? Um, and so pest is any organism that is harmful to humans or human concerns. And I have like the rogues gallery of things up here on the screen, things that some people might consider pests and other people might say are not pests. So we start in the upper left corner. This is Canada thistle, um, a very problematic weed in some settings. We've got aphids on a, a plant. We've got milkweed, tussock, caterpillars. We've got cabbage, caterpill cabbage moth caterpillars, cicadas, dandelions, Norway rats, uh, dogwood sawflies. Now, some people would put all of these in a pest category that they are harmful. Others would say, hold on there. Some of these are actually native species. I mean, dogwood sawflies, that's a native uh, caterpillar uh, or sawfly uh, larvae. Uh, milkweed mus uh, tussock caterpillars, those are native. Um, the aphids, many, many species of aphids are native. And if they're just a natural part of the ecosystem, are they really pests? That's an open question, and it's up to each gardener, uh, homeowner, to decide what they consider a pest in their land, in their yard. And we take that somewhat fuzzy definition, 
And then we go to pesticide. And a pesticide is simply a chemical that kills a pest. Um, and pesticides are divided into categories. Herbicides are the ones that control plants. Insecticides control insects. Fungicides control fungi. Rodenticides control rodents. There are probably another couple categories I'm not thinking of, but you get the idea. Pesticide is a really general umbrella term that doesn't tell you much other than it's generally a chemical that generally kills something. So when I have conversations with people and they speak about pesticides, my first step is to try and narrow that down. What are you really talking about? Because the impacts, the non-target damage, um, the mode of action of every group is very different. So I'll try to be specific tonight when I'm talking about a specific group of pesticides, I'll try and use that particular name. And on the right here, you see we've got the Dacanil fungicide, that's a very popular fungicide, Roundup, uh, a very popular uh, herbicide, and seven, of course, a very popular uh, insecticide. And we're gonna be talking more about those last two categories. So first I wanna just you know, put in a plug for Extension and a great uh, publication that came out recently. If you haven't seen it, oh, I'm not sure how recent, within the last few five years, what gardeners should know about pesticides and not, a lot of the information I'm gonna give you came from that. Um, it is free to download. Uh, if you don't wanna pay for a hard copy, the uh, 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 link is there. All you have to do is go to Extension, um, where they sell all of the publications and put in PPP-109 and um, this one will come up and you can download it. So great resource. Okay, very simple overall guidance that everybody, everyone who's a gardener knows this, the happier your plants are, the less pest control you need because it's stressed plants attract pests. The best way to avoid needing to deal with pests is to keep your plants watered, to keep them from being drought stressed, um, to avoid weeds as pests by planting densely enough so that you don't have large bare areas that will attract weeds, um, and use mulch as necessary to keep weeds from coming up in between. If you do have pests to deal with, and that can be pests in the sense of weeds or insects or diseases, um, always use integrated pest management. So coming from that resource I showed you a minute ago, it's kind of the three steps you start with start integrated pest management with. First step is, what do you have? What is the problem if it's an insect uh, or a disease? You know, what are the symptoms? And identify specifically what organism is causing the problem. And the second step is you determine how much uh, damage you and the plant can tolerate. I love the way they put that. It's not just the plant and whether it can tolerate the damage of that insect or the weeds that are encroaching or the disease. It's also what you can handle because you have an emotional investment in your garden, I know I do. And if you're seeing it die away due to some pest, um, you may want to take steps in order to keep your plants uh, from being destroyed. And the third step is once you know all this, what it is, how much damage you can tolerate and the plant can tolerate, then you decide, should I do something? You always have to take that decision, that decision to take action. Um, do you want to do that or do you just want to let things run their course? Now let's talk about weeds as a pest first. And the book, uh, What Gardeners Should Know About Pesticides, lays out a really nice integrated pest management step-by-step -step of, of how you should look at uh, weeds or insects or diseases. And it's a five-step process. And you don't get to the pesticide option until number five. So the idea is you think first about exclusion. Okay, how can you exclude weeds from your garden? 
Well, you can put down landscape fabric. Everyone knows that's not, not a great solution, but that would keep weeds from coming up. It's a rather temporary and, like I said, not a great solution for reasons we can discuss if you want. But mulch is another way, you know, wood chip mulch, basically uh, keeping weeds from being able to come up between your plants. Cultural control is a second option. You keep the plants as healthy as possible. You keep them planted densely so that there isn't space for weeds. The third is biological control options to consider. There aren't many of those when it comes to weeds. Um, you know, the only possibility for that is like if you had purple loosestrife as a weed in your garden, we have biological control for that, but we really don't have biological controls for most of the other weeds that you would commonly encounter in a garden. And then you get to mechanical control, and that's where I think we all end up, right? You get out the hoe, you get out the trowel, and you get down on your hands and knees, and you weed out the weeds. And for most weeds, that is probably the best way to go. Um, We'll talk about a few weeds where that even the more as much mechanical control as you can do, you, can, you will still have problems controlling them. We'll get to that. But if it's possible, weeding is your best option uh, after all of these other considerations, planting densely, mulch and so on. But if none of that does the job and you're still looking at weeds that are having impacts on your desired plants, that's when you start talking about pesticides. And in the case of weeds, that means herbicides. So a little bit about herbicides. I'm familiar with herbicides because I use them to control invasive species in natural areas. And that's where it's very common for them to be used because you're using it on large areas, acres instead of square feet. And it's possible to use uh, herbicides in settings like that and have very little non-target damage. Like you can go into the woods and you can take an acre of Asian bush honeysuckle and you can cut it all down and you can paint the stumps with an herbicide and have very little impact on the native plants all around. That is a lot harder to do in a garden setting because in most cases you're looking at weeds that are directly next to your desirable plant. And by spraying the weed, you may hurt the desirable plant. And that's not what you want to do. Um, when you're in a garden setting, most of the time um, you're dealing with annual weeds. That tends to be the bulk of what you're dealing with. Things like ragsweed and mare's tail and common chickweed and, and things like that. Um, those are super easy to pull out. They have little root systems and you can dig them out easily. Perennial weeds are where you run into more trouble because they have an extensive root system and can be very difficult to remove with just mechanical control weeding. Things like Canada thistle and chameleon plant and gout weed. These are three perennial plants that can become really problematic in a garden setting. And unless you're willing to go to an herbicide to control those, Often your only chance, your only hope is to dig out all of the soil, sieve out all of the rhizome fragments, and then replace the soil. So I've, I've pictured a couple of, of herbicides here, of weed stock for lawns, crabgrass killer, and natural horticultural vinegar. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, herbicides now, the different types that are out there. I've got four herbicides pictured right here. The first is weed stop for lawns. These are just examples. And it is a mix of active ingredient 2,4-D and dicamba. Roundup is an uh, active ingredient glyphosate. Scythe from Dow is uh, active ingredient pelargonic acid. And natural horticulture vinegar, uh, active ingredient acetic acid. So let's talk about the way that we classify herbicides and how each of these is classified, okay? The first way is, are they a systemic herbicide or contact? This is super important to know because systemic herbicides, you apply to the leaves and they go all the way through the plant to the roots and kill the whole plant. 
contact herbicides, by contrast, you spray on the leaves and they kill the leaves. They don't get translocated in the plant. They don't kill the roots. So in a sense, using a contact herbicide is essentially the same as cutting it off. You're just top killing the top part. You haven't done anything to the root system. So you can imagine if you've got an annual plant that doesn't have much of a root system to start with, a contact herbicide might kill it. But if you have a perennial plant, a contact herbicide is not going to kill it because the root system is still there and it will simply re-sprout. So these four examples, which is which? Weed stop for lawn is systemic. We'll kill the whole uh, perennials. Glyphosate, systemic. Pelargonic acid, contact. Acetic acid, contact. So this kind of sorts out right away what you can target with these types of herbicides. The second way that we classify them is synthetic versus organic. Synthetic herbicides are created in a lab and they are often crafted to mimic plant hormones um, versus organic herbicides are chemicals that occur naturally. So for our four examples, which is which? The crabgrass killer, weed stuff for lungs, synthetic. Roundup, synthetic. Pelargonic acid, organic. Acetic acid, organic. Uh, and I will say that all of the orga organic herbicides I know of um, are contact herbicides. I don't think there are any systemic um, organic herbicides, meaning that organic herbicides are generally not going to be used on perennial plants. They're only going to be used on annual plants uh, to be successful. And third, another way that we classify herbicides is selective versus broad spectrum. Selective is it only kills a certain subset of plants, whereas broad spectrum will kill any plant that it's applied to. And how do our four examples compare? The weed stop for lawn is selective because it will kill um, some broad leaves and uh, not others. And, and it will also kill crabgrass because of the mix that's in there. Roundup is broad spectrum. Yeah, you can use it on any type of plant to kill it. Pelargonic acid is broad spectrum and natural horticultural vinegar is broad spectrum. That is all this broad spectrum ones, if you apply them to a variety of different plants, they will kill them, at least the top part of the plant. For the uh, contact herbicides, that's probably all that's gonna die, the top part of the plant. Um, but any species could be affected by it. Okay, my plug that I, I just gave you four labeled herbicides. I want to make it clear that there are there's a lot of bad information out on Facebook and the internet in general. And um, please do use labeled products um, that have all the safety information on them and all of the, the information about where you should, should not use that herbicide. There's a lot of information on the label. There are a lot of homemade weed killers out there. And, in, and this one involves vinegar, salt, and dish soap which it's just such a, a, a witch's brew of poisons. It's hard to imagine putting that uh, on in my garden, but some people feel that that's natural. Well, yes, it's got vinegar, which is acetic acid, but vinegar, table vinegar is not horticultural vinegar. Horticultural vinegar is something like 20% active ingredient. Table vinegar is like 5% vinegar, uh, active ingredient. So it's probably not gonna be very effective. It's not intended to be used on plants. Salt, don't ever put salt on anything in the natural world. Salt kills everything and it can stay in the soil. It will kill all of the soil biota. And dish soap, again, if it's in enough quantity, it's really gonna harm any of the invertebrates out there. They're very susceptible to soap. So use labeled products rather than homemade poisons. And um, yeah, when we get to the, to the end, I'm happy to talk more about all that. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I make this point 
is that people feel this is more natural and less harmful. But the mechanism of, of this, of, of vinegar, salt, and dish soap is really to kill everything, animals and plants. If we look at glyphosate as an example of an herbicide, the way glyphosate works is it disrupts the shikimic acid pathway because it inhibits an enzyme. And because of that, they can't make the aromatic amino acids that the plant needs to grow. And that kills the plant. So that shikimic acid pathway is found only in bacteria, archaea, fungi, algae, some protozoans, and plants. It's not found in animals. It's not found in birds. It's not found in mammals. It's not found in worms. And so this mechanism cannot harm those organisms. That said, any given herbicide has not only the active ingredient, but also other inert ingredients added, and in, including surfactants, which are a soap-like um, uh, substance. And those could have uh, more impact on uh, animals. So this is the reason why like, those who are professionals want to use herbicides that are synthesized to go after a, particularly plant, a particular plant pathway because the likelihood of them having any impact on animals is much, 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 much less than something like salt. Okay, so that's the basics of herbicides. Um, the, the summary is keep your plants happy and mulched well to avoid weeds. Uh, if you have annual weeds to kill, weed them, or you can use a contact herbicide for that if you're comfortable with a pelargonic acid or acetic acid, you can buy those and use those on annual weeds. But if you have those persistent perennial weeds to kill, like Canada, Canada thistle and Johnson grass and so on, generally the, the way to be successful is to use a systemic herbicide um, to, to kill those plants. You, it is a challenge in a garden because you have your good plants right next to the Canada thistle, often using a physical barrier like a bucket over your good plant, spraying around it. Um, will protect the good plant and you can kill out the perennial in, in invasive that's causing problems. Otherwise, it's digging and soil sieving on those really uh, difficult plants. So now we're going to talk about insects. That was kind of the weed portion. Insects, uh, again, you start with you have to identify what you're dealing with. You have to determine how much damage you can tolerate and your plants can tolerate, and then you have to decide if you want to intervene. And the step one for me, because I'm a botanist, you know, this is step one of knowing what what weeds you're dealing with, that's kind of easy for me. I've been challenged by some of the insects that I've found in my garden and trying to figure out what they are. Um, but here are two situations where people could be very concerned about seeing dogwood sawflies, which will get on um, dog, any species of dogwood shrub, and you can have 10, 15, 20 per leaf. Um, I had this in my yard on my precious pagoda dogwood that I had just planted the year before, and the sawfly larvae showed up, and I was horrified because half Fully half of the leaves of the pagoda, pagoda dogwood were covered and were being eaten down to nothing. And so it once I identified it, then I had to go to mm -hmm. how much damage. Jade, did you have a question? Yeah, we have a question. Deb was wondering, this is sort of backtracking to the um, perennials. If, if you could use a contact herbicide on, would you be able to use a contact herbicide on a perennial if it was used multiple times? to sort of maybe weaken the plant over the long term? You could, but it would be exactly the same as if you had just taken a weed whacker and cut it down. And I, I don't know that it's easier to come up, get your spray together and then spray every plant. Why not just cut them down? Because that's what you're doing with a contact herbicide. 
but you could. You could do it over and over and over again. Uh, you'd you'd want to read the label carefully because it would tell you how much of the product you could put down in a given area before you would start to see negative impacts to your soil and anything else. Okay, good question. So once you identify it, then you figure out can I handle the damage? And for me, with a beautiful pagoda dogwood I had planted the year before and half of the leaves being eaten down to nothing, I decided that I was going to intervene. And I'll talk about what I did in a little bit. So you kind of have to make that decision. Many people see milkweed, tussock moth, caterpillars on their common milkweed and get very concerned because they do the same thing as the sawfly larvae. They do march across the leaf and eat it down to nothing. Generally though, uh, milkweed plants respond to that kind of herbivory simply by putting up another sprout somewhere else and a new plant. So unless it is a brand new plant that hasn't established yet, normally that kind of uh, native insect problem is not going to kill a plant. Other examples of insect damage that you may see in your garden that you might have to think about, do I want to do something here? The leaf cutting bees. Have you ever seen those really cool semicircles on rose leaves? There, there are other species impacted as well. And the bee literally curls that thing up, flies it away and uses it as food in uh, where they lay their eggs. Um, this is mostly an aesthetic thing. So in terms of can the plant handle it, for sure, usually these are really not going to endanger the survival of, of a plant. But can you handle the aesthetic damage if these are your, your beautiful roses and you don't want to see that on the leaves? That's your own kind of personal choice. Um, and of course, these are native bees as well. So, you know. Head clipping weevils are another common insect problem, one that I struggle a lot with in my yard, where this is a Rebecca here, black eyed Susan, and the head cutting weevil, this little guy comes and incises a line right underneath the flower head, and then it falls over. And the flower head dies while the weevil goes in and eats out the, the middle of the flower head and lays its egg for next year. So you have to decide, you know, I'm growing these plants for the aesthetics flowers and I'm not getting any flowers because head cutting weevils are causing them all to fall down. Um, this is, I've got a front yard with hundreds of cone flowers and they had cut about half of the flower heads off one year um, before I started taking action. And I'll tell you what I did on that too. So know your problem and what kind of impacts it's gonna have. Importantly, if you can't figure it out, and there are an awful lot of insects and diseases out there, um, check with your extension office. That's always a really good first place to go to see if they can ID it for you. If they don't, uh, I don't know if any of you have used the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab, PPDL. It is one of the great resources in this state for people who grow plants. I've used them before. Uh, you can find them at this website. They will identify anything for you. You send them a sample and for $11, they will tell you what the problem is and they will give you advice on how to deal with it. So if you're struggling to come up with what is this that's causing the damage to my plants, there's a couple places to look. Okay, so now looking at that same five-step thinking process of integrated pest management, but this time for insects, exclusion would be your first step. Is there some way I can keep insects off my plants? The way you can do that is you can put netting around them, but usually we're planting because of the aesthetics and we really don't want netting covering all of our plants all of the time. When the 17 year cicadas came out a few years ago, People who had young trees that were vulnerable to cicadas um, were advised to put netting that was uh, fine enough to exclude the cicadas. 
over their trees so they wouldn't be impacted. But that was kind of a short term thing. You wouldn't want to have to have netting over all your plants all the time to exclude uh, insects. And because there are so many native insects, and that's for some, for some of us why we are growing plants. We want most of the insects to have access to our native plants or our garden plants. Cultural control, again, you're keeping the plants as healthy as you can, so they are able to fight off the pests and diseases. So you may have a few uh, bugs eating leaves, but it's not going to be something that threatens um, the life of the plant. Biological control, again, there's not a lot of biological control options for most of what we're dealing with in a garden setting. But mechanical control, again, is where I usually come down. Those dogwood sawflies that were all over the leaves on my pagoda dogwood, I got a bucket, I pulled them off one by one, I tossed them in the pond for the frogs to eat. Um, and that was it for that year. They came back the next year, I did the same thing, and now the plant is established enough that I don't care if there are dogwood sawflies on it. They're not gonna harm the, over, the, the life of that plant may eat some leaves, but the plant's gonna survive. And the head cutting weevils, I do what a lot of people do. I go out with a bucket of soapy water and every time I see a cut head, carefully put one hand under the head, snap it off into the soapy water. Often the beetle is still in there, the soapy water kills it, and I've removed the flower head that might have the, the eggs for next year and you don't want to leave the eggs there and deal, continue to deal with it. So there's a, a lot of different mechanical control options. But if all those fail you, then you think about pesticides. So let's talk a little about pesticides. Insecticides are usually, um, the risk of using pesticides is often um, looked at in three ways. What's the persistence, what's the toxicity, and what's the mobility? I have shown three different pesticides here, um, and we'll go through it. Let's start with the pyrethrins. Now this is organic. Pyrethrin insecticides uh, are uh, chemicals that are found in nature. They are broad spectrum. That is any insecticide, insect that is treated will die. They persist just one to two days. So low persistence. The LD50 is 750 milligrams per kilogram. What that means, LD50 is the L lethal dose in which 50% of the insect population dies. And because this is a relatively small number, that means it's fairly toxic. It doesn't take much quantity to kill 50% of the insects. And pyrethrins have low mobility in the soil. So where you treat it, it's not likely to move, okay? Let's look at seven. Seven is a well-known insecticide. It used to have an active ingredient of carbaryl, which is an incredibly toxic, um, insecticide. They stopped using it because it is so toxic. They changed to something called zeta cypermethrin, and it's a synthetic designed insecticide that's to, uh, designed to be similar to the pyrethrins in its action, but longer lasting. And so it's broad, it's synthetic, it's broad spectrum. It lasts to three months compared to the pyrethrins persisting one to two days. The LD50 is 10,248 milligrams per kilogram, a much bigger number, which means that it is less toxic. This is a very less toxic than the pyrethrins. It takes much, much, much more quantity to kill half of the insects. This also has low mobility. And then there's always neem oil. Neem oil is organic, found in nature. It is broad spectrum. It persists three to 22 days. The LD50 is 31,950 milligrams per kilogram. So it is, has a really, really low toxicity and it has low mobility. 
So this kind of gives you a sense of what's out there and the ways to sort of rank it in your mind as to whether you are comfortable with it or not uh, and what the numbers are. And you can find these numbers online very easily for any insecticide if you want to sort of compare the risk. But I want to compare that to a particular class of insecticides called neonicotinoids. Much of the rest of this, I'm going to be talking about neonicotinoids because this is something that to some extent has flown under the radar. And I want to make sure people understand how different and how dangerous neonicotinoids are compared to the three that I just talked about here. Neonicotinoids you can see the word nicotine in there, right? Ne nicotine was the, in, uh, was the original insecticide. It's just a natural compound. It's in tobacco leaves and it kills insects. What they did uh, there back in the 1990s was they took the nicotine molecule and they changed it around to make it so that it would bind much more strongly to insect nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which is how uh, neonics, for short, work. They uh, uh, go to those receptors. And they made it very specific to insects, so it would be highly toxic to them, but not to vertebrates. So they made it more specific. They did some other things with them, too. And here, these names here uh, are names of particular neonics that we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about. Surprisingly to many people, neonics are by far the most used insecticide in the world now. And they were just created in the 1990s. So we went to zero, from zero to everywhere very, very quickly. Back in uh, the uh, 1990s, before neonics hit the market, it was mostly organophosphates and pyrethroids. We talked about pyrethrin, that's part of the pyrethroids. The green and the blue lines, that's what was being used. And then when the red line, the neonics hit the market, suddenly we went like this. And this is the proportion of corn in the US that is treated. And we've gone from about 10 to 20% used to be treated in various ways to now better than 90% of the corn that is uh, planted is treated with neonics. So why? I mean, that's when I saw this, I thought, for heaven's sake, somehow we managed to only treat 10 to 20% of the corn crops in the US and now we're treating over 90%? How can that be? Well, first, here's the mode of action. Um, basically, it, it blocks those nerve receptors in an open position. And so the, there's constant stimulation. The dose accumulates over time and the overstimulation leads to death. Okay, so how it gets applied is through seed treatments. This picture here, these are treated seeds covered with a neonic dust. It can be added to irrigation water. It can be used as a soil drench. A foliar spray can be applied as a granule in pastures, injected in trees. If you're familiar with people injecting ash trees to save them from EAB, that's imidacloprid, uh, uh, and that is um, a neonic. And it, they are used topically on pets as advantage too. So the re so these are all the different ways they can be uh, treated. The vast majority is it's all seed treatments. That's what's going on statistically. I mean, it's just almost one hundred percent seed treatments is how this is getting out in the environment, and that's because it's prophylactic rather than IPM. IPM is the integrated pest management. Step one, know what pest you have. Step two, determine you know, what kind of damage is it going to cost and cause and then selectively treat to, to, do, uh, to uh, deal with it. That's not what this is. This is prophylactic. This is every corn kernel that every farmer is planting is pre-treated with neonics, whether there's any corn rootworm in that crop field or not. 
So that's how we went from just 10 to 20 percent of the crop area being treated to everything is getting treated because the seed is treated. So now let's talk about the mobility, persistence, and toxicity. Mobility first. It's highly mobile in capital letters, and I should have put some exclamation points there. First, the dust is dispersed during sowing. In a few months, we're going to be at corn planting time. And when you go down the road and you see the planters out there and you see sort of a whitish dust coming off the machines, that's neonic dust. And it goes a long, long way from where the seeds are being put in the ground. About 2 to 20% of that seed dressing, coating the seed, actually goes into the corn plant. And it renders that plant toxic to any corn rootworms that try to eat it. And that's why they treat the seeds. But most of it, like 80%, is in the soil and it's water soluble. So that means as it rains, it's moving down the, so the water column, it's getting into the um, tiles, then going out into the creeks, it's getting into the water table, it's moving everywhere. And how it works is just like it works in the corn plant, any plant, that encounters neonics in the soil will take them up and become toxic to insects. That's what it does. So if you are anywhere near a farm field, your plants may be toxic because the neonics goes that far, gets in your soil, gets taken up by your plants in your garden. So highly mobile, which is a real concern. How persistent are neonics? Well, the half-lives, and a soil half-life is just like what it sounds like. If the soil half-life, let's say it's 1,250 days, at the end of that time, half of the compound is gone, but half, half is still there. And in another 1,250 days, another half is gone. So now you're down to one quarter of what was uh, first applied back when. So the half-lives for these three neonics, uh, imidacloprid, diamethazam, and clothianidin, sorry, I have trouble pronouncing some of those, are quite long. Um, one example in real life, there was a study of um, Clothianidin in North Dakota clay loam, because this particular type of soil you have and how the moisture regime and everything else can impact how long the compounds last. Well, it lasted, um, it was 3.8 years was the half-life for one of these uh, in one setting. And again, at 3.8 years, only half is gone. Half is still there. The pro next problem is that the metabolites can also be persistent. So the one um, neonic can biodegrade down to a different uh, bio, uh, neonic, which also, so both of them have half-lives. So even as it starts to degrade, what it degrades into may also have half-lives. And by contrast, nicotine, the original molecule that all these are based on, its half-life is about one half of a day. So they added in this persistence as they developed these chemicals. We have a and quick finally, question. how toxic are they? Yeah, Jay, go ahead. Okay, Ingrid is wondering, how much did scientists know about the impacts of neonics before they were introduced to the market? And how did they test those long-term impacts on plants and animals? Good questions. Um, in some sense, they knew because it's in their ads. If you look at the ads from Bayer in 2014, when they really started rolling this out, especially for termites in the houses, it says, um, you know, this is gonna last forever in your house. And this is going to have incredible toxicity. And so that was part of the selling. 
where things sort of fell apart was that it appears that um, the Empire Environmental Protection Agency uh, and the the uh, FDA really weren't looking closely at what that meant when these compounds got outside of the um, area where they were um, introduced and that way that there would be so many non-target animals that could be damaged by what was put into a crop field. So the people selling it knew the government didn't seem to pick up on how dangerous this was until fairly recently. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Good question, Ingrid. Also, um, Barbara was wondering if there's an alternative to the imidacloprid that um, was used on the ash trees for the ash borer. No. You, you can't inject a tree. I, I, to my knowledge, no. I, I think the reason they're using it is because you can put it in there. It will last a really, really, really long time. It will be incredibly toxic to whatever eats that tree. And yeah, you got to make the choice of um, how, how much is it worth to keep that ash alive with the damage that might be done. Okay, and now let's talk toxicity, which is like the cherry on top of a really bad Sunday. I won't use the word I was going to use. It's incredibly toxic. Uh, remember when we were talking about the perithrins and seven, and it was how many milligrams per kilogram does it take to kill half of a population? With neonics, it's not... Uh, micrograms, it's it's nanograms, like one ten thousandth of that amount. So one billionth of a gram is a nanogram. And these are the levels that it takes to kill a bee. Um, a neonicotinoid, it takes four nanograms versus DDT, which I think we all recognize was a fairly uh, toxic uh, pesticide takes 27,000 nanograms per bee. bee. So this is much, 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 much more toxic than um, DDT. And note, here's the kicker. Note that a typical application rate, one corn kernel gets dusted with neonic seed. That's about 1.25 milligrams on a corn kernel. That one corn kernel now has enough neonics to kill 150,000 honeybees if it were somehow evenly applied. So incredibly toxic to, in, uh, to insects. And again, that's how they sold this was, you want something toxic? We have it for you, neonics. This is a comparison across different types of insecticides. Neonics is on one end, erythroids that we talked about earlier at the other end. How much does it take to kill uh, half of the earthworms in a container in 14 days. For neonics, it's so close to zero, it's hard to say what that number is. It's in the nanograms again, versus carbamates and organophosphates. And then you get to perithroids, and it takes a fair amount of perithroids to actually kill earthworms. So again, looking at the uh, high toxicity of neonics compared to other um, insecticides. So fairly recently, uh, a few years ago, um, this is from the Center for Biological Diversity, but the EPA had just put out the final biological evaluations. They kind of came late to this, but they did biological evaluations uh, in the early 2020s to figure out what the impacts really were after they had already approved the use of these chemicals. Um, and they confirmed that the three widely used neonics likely harm three quarters of all endangered plants and animals, including all 39 species of amphibians protected under the Endangered Species Act. So now it's become clear that this is pretty much a disaster. Um, and the EPA is doing more reviews right now in order to um, rethink how these should be used. Um, but in the meantime, we have seen the insect apocalypse happen and the 
leading theory on that is neonics. There are other factors as well, you know, lack of habitat and so on. But given the time period we're talking about, the 1990s to now, the incredible plummeting populations of insects, that correlates very tightly with when the neonics came out. Um, and given their persistency, persistence and toxicity, it's not too much of a stretch to think that this could be the reason that we have seen such a loss of insects. Let me give you one insect example. The Pauchiac uh, skipperling is a little rare uh, skipper. And in its heyday, it covered most of the prairie states. But in, uh, there were 296 historical locations that people knew of. Even, even after most of the prairie was destroyed, there were still 296 historical location. But only 14 sites now have that butterfly. And the black triangles indicate where it used to be, and now it's gone. And the green triangles indicate where it's still holding on. So if we compare that map to the maps showing where neonics are used, we see that by 2011, this map, this darkest color means that's where most, the, the highest levels of neonics were applied. That's right where most of the um, historic populations were of this skipperling. And the places where we see it in green here are in places that have lower neonic use. And over here in Southern Michigan, and again, this is just correlation, but it seems to have a real connection to where there are where there are crop fields, where they are using neonics, is where we are seeing the greatest reduction of insects. We have another quick question. Um, Nancy was asking, how is it that these companies, yeah. Dow, Monsanto, Bayer, can still produce such a highly dangerous and toxic chemical? Is it about money? Well, the thing is that farming relies on chemicals. Um, a lot of things rely on chemicals, and it's a matter of how do we balance the protection of the environment with the um, farming that we need to produce food for ourselves. Um, nobody has found a way to produce food at scale, at the scale that we need without the use of some chemicals. In this case, it looks like these are relatively new compounds that were not tested well before they were released and were now suffering um, that lack of oversight. Um, I, I did a lot of um, uh, studying. I, I just wrote a paper on um, pesticide impacts on birds. It's in the latest issue of Indiana Audubon, if, if you're a member. And, um, there is a lot of review going on at any given time of all the studies that are happening. And so decisions are being changed on a wide variety of pesticides based on what they find out. Most of the pesticides that we deal with have been around for many, many decades. And so there's been time to do the testing and change how things are used. Many chemicals get moved into the restricted use if, if it's found that there were more impacts than were first known. This is a case where they're fairly new and they're still figuring out all the impacts. So that, that's my best answer. Um, a program that came out, the Prairie Conservation Strip Program, I remember hearing about this and thinking, what a fantastic idea. You have a farm field and, and you put um, little prairies into it. And by doing that, you reduce the, the soil loss, you increase um, plant species diversity, and you get more birds. And the thing was, this was happening, this, this program was happening the same time that neonics were being rolled out. And at this point, we know you don't want prairie strips anywhere near a cornfield because that cornfield is being planted with neonic treated seeds. And you may have good plant diversity, but every insect that eats those plants is going to die. So it's not a great fit. Crop fields at this point, if they are using neonics, are incredibly toxic habitats. 
There were great studies done by Christian Krupke and his colleagues at Purdue um, early on. Uh, he had some of the first studies out in 2014, ringing the alarm bells. Um, he found in a 2017 paper that this, this is specific to Indiana. 94% of honeybee foragers in Indiana are at risk of exposure to varying levels of neonics during corn planting that spring season. Over 42% of the state of Indiana is contaminated by neonic residues during corn planting. And you know, you think about that, and then you think about the um, persistence and that every year they're putting down more neonic dust on, on these crop fields, um, it, it, that, that toxicity lasts a really, really long time. And here was the kicker of this particular study. There was no benefit of the neonic treatment of corn seed in terms of crop yield. So the farmers who weren't using the neonics had the same crop yields as the ones who were. And again, this is a prophylactic treatment. So, you know, they were putting out all of this insecticide without really knowing whether it was going to help or not. So why would they do that? Why would they pay for it? Because fully treated soybean seeds, and for that matter, corn seeds, come with robust replant coverage. If the stand fails, they can get 100% seed reimbursement. But if the seeds aren't treated, insurance isn't going to cover them. So, or they will cover them at a much lower rate. So the system is set up such that if you want crop insurance, you're going to need to use neonic treated seeds. It's a very perverse incentive. One thing, one other thing, we've talked a lot about bees here. And one of the questions I got the first time I gave this talk was, was, well, how does this affect birds? And I didn't really know. And that's why I wrote the pesticide impacts on bird study. And remember that one corn kernel treated with neonics can kill 150,000 honeybees. One corn kernel treated with neonics can kill a small bird. And have you seen how corn planting happens in Indiana? There's always uh, spilled corn around where they were doing the planting. Some falls out and it's a pile on the ground and the, all the birds come in to eat the corn seeds. And it's incredibly toxic to birds as well. Okay, so that's in crop fields. And we know that that can also impact your garden if you are anywhere near a farm field. I am. Um, we have a farm, a corn, that's something that's a cornfield, you know, interspersed with beans every few years, um, right next to where I garden. And, and that's a considerable concern for me that um, I can't really know that I'm providing good habitat because my plants may have neonics in them from the soil. But in garden plants that you buy, you can also end up having neonics. It is common for perennial garden plants and trees, shrubs to be treated with neonics and the treatment can last for years. And for many years, that was the selling point for these. You will not have those awful insects eating the leaves on your plants. In recent years, some big box stores like Lowe's and Walmart have said they are taking a stand and they are phasing out uh, the sale of plants treated with neonics. It is hard to find any evidence that this is actually the case. I would feel much better about these statements that these stores make if I could go to Lowe's or Walmart and I could see insect holes on any of the plants. Generally, I don't. Um, so I, I would love to be corrected. I would love to find out that there is a store, uh, a big box store that is selling things that are not neonic treated. Um, but I don't know that you can trust um, that. There are some, uh, of course, we have many native plant sellers in Indiana, and you can go to the Buy Natives directory on the indiananativeplants.org website to see our native sellers. Um, as far as I know, none of those 
uh, sellers are using neonics or long lasting pesticides in their uh, plants. And there is one line of plants, the American Beauties native plants, they advertise that they do not use neonics. And I find that a little more believable. Um, the thing to do is always ask where you're buying plants. Do you treat these with insecticides? Do you use neonics? Because um, most of us don't want them, but it can be hard to avoid them. So here's my summary. Um, keep your plants happy to make them less vulnerable to insect pests. If insects won't kill your plants, consider letting them be. If you're going to lose the plant to insects because the level of infestation is so high, consider a limited use of organic insecticides like neem oil or perithrins. And never, ever, 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 ever use neonicotinoid insecticides. And I'm sorry if I've gone over a few minutes. Um, I would be happy to take any questions that, that you still have. Thanks. Um, there are a couple that have popped up in the chat. Um, S'more65 wants to know, are the neonics used on annuals, perennials? Does it matter? That is a good question. I. I'm not sure if they're used on annuals or not. The real draw is to use them in long-lived perennials because essentially, and especially trees and shrubs is, is where they're usually used because you can treat them once and that'll last for years. Um, it's probably not worth them treating annual plants because those plants are only alive for you know six months at most. Um, so I, I think perennials is the larger issue, but I'm not positive on that ask whoever you're buying from ask yeah and nancy was saying um a lot of nurseries don't know if their plants have been treated with unix and i i worked at a nursery for a little while and we got a lot of our plants from south america or wherever was cheapest and i don't think they knew they can't answer the question the answer is yes yeah. <laughs> and we'll go away I mean, that's my answer. It's like, you don't yeah. know about this issue, then you're probably doing this because it's kind of an industry standard. So mm -hmm. the answer is yes, they are. Yeah. Okay, well, if, um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions, but we can always forward them on and I will try and figure out how this is going to be posted and be in contact when we're done with the record recording of it thing. All right. Thank you again. This has been awesome. Oh, thank you all. Glad to do it. Have a good evening. Yeah, bye guys. Bye.